Welcome to Ideas. I'm Paul Kennedy, and tonight we're in Toronto for the final lecture on this year's national tour of the 2004 Massey Lectures. We're in the Macmillan Theatre on the campus of the University of Toronto, and there are over 800 people here tonight to listen to Ronald Wright give the fifth and last of this year's Massey Lectures, A Short History of Progress. The Massey Lectures began in 1961, and they've had a profound effect on what we might call the national conversation in this country. What it is that makes us who we are, and what the issues are that face us, both as Canadians and as citizens of the world. This year, the Massey lecturer is novelist and archaeologist Ronald Wright. His books include the futuristic satirical novel A Scientific Romance and a number of highly popular books about the people who lived in the Americas before the Europeans arrived. Time Among the Maya, Cut Stones and Crossroads, and Stolen Continents. Tonight, from the Macmillan Theatre at the University of Toronto, The Rebellion of the Tools, the last of the 2004 Massey Lectures. Here's Ronald Wright. I have a weakness for cynical graffiti, and I mean reading them, not scribbling them. One relevant to the hazards of progress is this. Each time history repeats itself, the price goes up. The collapse of the first civilization on Earth, that of the Sumerians in what is now southern Iraq, affected only half a million people. The fall of Rome affected tens of millions, and if ours were to fail, it would, of course, bring catastrophe on billions. So far in these talks, I've looked at four ancient societies, Sumer, Rome, the Maya, and Easter Island, which in roughly a thousand years each wore out their welcome from nature and collapsed. I've also mentioned two exceptions, Egypt and China, who achieved a run of 3,000 years or more. In his book on past collapses, Joseph Tainter nicknames three kinds of trouble, the runaway train, the dinosaur, and the house of cards. These usually act together. The Sumerian's irrigation was certainly a runaway train, a disastrous course from which they could not deviate. Their ruler's failure to tackle the problem qualifies them as dinosaurs, and the civilization's swift and irreparable fall shows it to have been a house of cards. Much the same can be said of the other failures. We are faced by something deeper than mistakes at any particular time or place. The invention of agriculture is itself a runaway train, leading to vastly expanded populations, but seldom solving the food problem because of two inevitable or nearly inevitable consequences. The first is biological. The population grows until it hits the bounds of the food supply. The second is social. All civilizations become hierarchical. The upward concentration of wealth ensures that there can never be enough to go around. Thomas Malthus explored the first dilemma, and thinkers from Christ to Marx have touched on the second. As the Chinese saying has it, the peasant must stand a long time on the hillside with his mouth open before a roast duck flies in. <laughs> Civilization is an experiment, a very recent way of life in the human career, and it has a habit of walking into what I'm calling progress traps. A small village on good land beside a river is a good idea. But when the village grows into a city and paves over the good land, it becomes a bad idea. While prevention might have been easy, a cure may be impossible. 
This human inability to foresee long-range consequences may be inherent to our kind, shaped by the millions of years when we lived hand-to-mouth by hunting and gathering. It may also be little more than a mix of inertia, greed, and foolishness encouraged by the shape of the social pyramid. The concentration of power at the top of large-scale societies gives the elite a vested interest in the status quo. They continue to prosper in darkening times long after the environment and general populace begin to suffer. Yet despite the wreckage of past civilizations littering the earth, the overall experiment of civilization has continued to spread and grow. The numbers, insofar as they can be estimated, break down roughly as follows. A world population of 200 million or so at Rome's height in the second century AD. About 400 million by the year 1500 when Europe reached the Americas. One billion by 1825 at the start of the Coal Age. Two billion by 1925 when the Oil Age gets underway. And six billion by the year 2000. Even more startling than the growth is the acceleration. Adding 200 million after Rome took 13 centuries. Adding the latest 200 million took three years. We tend to regard our age as exceptional, and in many ways it is. But the parochialism of the present, the way our eyes follow the ball and not the game, is dangerous. Absorbed in the here and now, we lose sight of our course through time, forgetting to ask ourselves Paul Gauguin's final question, where are we going? If so many previous ages ran into natural limits and crashed, how has our runaway train, if that's what it is, been able to keep on gathering speed? I suggested earlier that the Chinese and Egyptian civilizations were exceptionally long-lived because nature gave them lavish subsidies of extra topsoil brought in by wind and water from elsewhere. But some credit must go to human ingenuity. The number of mouths an acre of land can support and the length of time it can go on supporting them doesn't depend only on natural fertility. Civilization did get better at farming as it went along. Crop rotation and the use of green manure, the plowing under of nitrogen-fixing plants, raised yields considerably in early modern times. The Asian development of wet rice cultivation was highly productive, and its precisely leveled paddy fields encouraged sustainable tillage on hillsides. The Islamic civilization of Spain not only handed down classical learning to late medieval Europe, it also healed the stricken landscape Rome had left behind by building olive terraces and advanced irrigation schemes. In the Andes, the Incas and pre-Incas built an efficient mountain agriculture on flights of stone terraces watered by glacial streams and fertilized with guano, which they mined from ancient seabird rookeries on arid coastal islands. Studies of Andean terracing in use for the past 1,500 years show no loss of fertility. Such steady improvements in farming methods can explain a steady rise in population, but not the great boom of the past few centuries. Mechanization and sanitation may account for later stages of the boom, but not its beginnings, which predate farm machinery and public health. The takeoff point was about one century after Columbus, and this was when the strange fruits of the Spanish conquest began to be digested. Europe received the greatest subsidy of all when half a planet fully developed but almost unprotected, fell suddenly into its hands. If America had been a wilderness, the invaders wouldn't have got much out of it for a long time. Every field would have had to be won from the forest, every crop imported and adapted, every mine discovered, every road cut across trackless desert and ranges. 
But this unknown world had had its own Neolithic revolution and had built a series of civilizations on a rich agrarian base. The three Americas, North, Central, and South, formed a complex world, much like Asia, teeming with 80 to 100 million people between a fifth and a fourth of the human race in 1492. The most powerful polities were the Aztec Empire, a city-state system dominated by the conurbation known as Mexico, and the Inca Empire stretching 3,000 miles down the spine of the Andes and Pacific coast. Each of these had roughly 20 million people, which puts them midway in scale between ancient Egypt and ancient Rome. With a quarter million citizens, the Aztec capital was the biggest city in the Americas and one of the half dozen biggest in the world. The Inca Empire was less urban, but tightly organized with paved roads, a command economy, and vast terracing and irrigation projects built by a labor tax system rather than slavery. Though hardly a worker's paradise, it soon began to look like one to survivors under Spanish rule. Both these empires were young, the heirs of others, and might have had centuries ahead of them if no outsiders had arrived. But they awaited intruders like orchards of ripe fruit. The environmental historians Alfred Crosby and William McNeil showed in the 1970s that the New World's true conquerors were germs, mass killers such as smallpox, measles, and bubonic plague. These arrived for the first time with the Europeans, who had resistance to them, and acted like biological weapons, killing the rulers and at least half the populations of Mexico and Peru in the first wave. Crosby wrote, the miraculous triumphs of the conquistadors are in large part the triumphs of the smallpox virus. Despite their guns and horses, the Spaniards did not achieve any major conquests on the mainland until after a smallpox pandemic had swept through. Before that, the Maya, Aztecs, Incas, and Floridians all repelled the first efforts to invade them. Some years ago, the Pentagon came up with plans for a, a strange Lovian weapon called the neutron bomb to be let off high over Russian cities so that a searing blast of radiation would kill all the people but leave the property unharmed. The European invaders of America had a weapon of exactly this effect in disease. Let nobody say the new world went down without a fight. The battles for Mexico and Cusco were among the hardest ever fought. But once the epidemiological veil was torn, the people became too few to defend what their ancestors had built up for 10,000 years. They died in heaps like bedbugs, wrote a Spanish friar in Mexico. Except for the Great Plains and cold regions, even North America was not wild in 1500. Hollywood may have persuaded us that the typical Indian was a nomadic hunter. But in truth, all temperate zones of the United States, from the southwest to the southeast and north to Missouri, Ohio, and the Great Lakes, were thickly settled by farming peoples. When the pilgrims arrived in Massachusetts, the Indians had died out so recently that the whites found empty houses, winter corn, and cleared fields waiting for their use a foretoken of the settlers' parasitic advance across the continent. Europeans did not find a wilderness here. American historian Francis Jennings has written, they made one. For the Spanish, disease was a better weapon than a neutron bomb because just enough Amerindians survived to work the mines. The Aztec and Inca treasures were only a down payment on all the gold and silver that would flow across the Atlantic for centuries.